invited, but there are some persons that is invited to sit at the table. And uh, you might have that those persons or that person might have something to say. You are not excluded really from the, the rest of the person that is there, but you are the highest than you up here, mm -hmm. if you understand what I'm saying. Because you might have something to say, they, they, as I said, they call it the head table. So you, some, some focus is on you up here. Some okay. Focus. All right. Yeah. Let me, yes, ma'am. Let me just put it down here like this. Let me just put it down here. The question is, is there a difference between being invited to dinner and a seat at the table? Okay. For, for me, I don't know. I look at it as in, um, I look at it from a different perspective. I'm looking at it that if I'm invited to dinner, I would must accept the invitation to, to, to go to the dinner. Yes, I'm invited, but I, but I don't accept. It's, it's a choice. It's a choice that you have, but I don't want to go on that because you're invited. But if I have a seat at the table, that means I have a reservation. And because I have a reservation, because the seat is already provided. Glory. And that simply means the seat is reserved for me. So therefore, so, 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 so therefore I, I have to go. It's a different a choice I own. But because they have a seat, then it forced me that I have to go because of the, I have a seat at the table. All yeah. right. Yeah. Won't y'all give that, that? That deserves some kind of hand clap or something, don't it? Okay. I, I, I agree with, with you. When you get invited to dinner, if I invite you, and I do want you to come, and you are right, you have a choice, but if I invite you, I am expecting you at some point to go home. <laughs> but if you have a seat at the table, that means that you are a part of the family, that every evening when the family gets together, you're going to come because that's your seat. In a family, when you sit down to eat dinner, those of us in my immediate family, my mom and dad are going to be there, my brother and sister, my brother and two other sisters are going to be there, and then there are some friends that we have that were not our blood relatives, but they were such close friends that they are like brothers and sisters. And in fact, when we went off to college, we'd come back home and Dwayne Little would be at the house making a salad and all of that kind of stuff. He wasn't a Hamilton, but he was family and he had a permanent and still does seat at the table. This is the difference that Michelle Chef Mephibosheth had. Now, do we know something about him? Yes. Who is Mephibosheth? He is a royal boy, isn't he? He is the grandson of Saul, the first king of Israel, right? He is anointed, and his dad is Jonathan, who is the heir apparent to the throne, and then being the firstborn son of Jonathan, he is a prince and he is going to ascend to be the king of Israel. And all of a sudden there are some things that even though you get to a position that God didn't put you there, you won't stay. And we found that to be true with Saul. And so Saul does not get to stay in the position, but God had somebody, had a little boy that was a shepherd down there. His daddy never didn't think I let much of it because when they came to anoint the next king, they kept him out in the field with the sheep. But Samuel said, no, it's got to be somebody else. They brought that little boy in, number eight, and when he did, they had to anoint him. He was the king. Now, he didn't get to be the king that day. He went through many hard struggles, but it was his destiny to be the king. And so he does come into the kingship, but while he's working for King Saul, for King Saul, and what I love about David is he was always respectful and humble. Even when Saul hated him, David still recognized the authority that Saul had. He recognized that God was his anointed. That's 
says something to us, we ought to unpack that right there and say, even if you don't like the elder, if you don't like the pastor, if you're not okay with the choir director, if God put them there, you ought to still show respect and authority. There ought to be some humbleness in who you are. So that was that was David's position. He became great friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. In fact, they made a covenant. And they said that we would take care of each other's family. Yes. Well, you know, as things will happen, life tends to happen. And this thing called life was happening to David. He was running for his life. He was running from Saul. He had to fight Saul's brother to get the full kingship, had to fight with Ishabah for five years, but finally David is now settled in the kingship and he recognizes the hand of God and he remembers his promise and he calls in one of Saul's servants and he says, uh, Ziba, you work for King Saul. Is there anybody from the house of Saul that I can bless? And, and that says something. Sometimes you ought to look back and help somebody. I'm not saying go back, but you ought to look back and help somebody. Oh, yeah. So Zeba says, yeah, there's a boy. Yes. Well, he's a man now. When he was five, he left. Now, why did he have to leave? Why did he have to leave his royal position at the age of five? There is a there is a coup d'etat and David is going to be king. Let me just tell you this. Anytime there is a change in administration, especially back then, they made sure that if that was your family, I'm not going to have you come up against opposition. So the best way for me to do that is just God kill you and wipe you out. And so that's what eventually happened to all of Saul's family. Now, Meshavashev, uh, is down there in a place because at five his nurse cared about him and they were trying to save him. She is saying, boy, you five years old, hurry up and run, they coming to kill you. So he can't run as fast so she picks him up and in her haste she drops him and breaks both his legs. And so now he is an invalid. He is uh, disabled for the rest of his life and so now he has to go to a place called Lodabar. Anybody know about Lodabar? Yeah. Lodabar, the word says that it means no words, no communication, no pastor is there. It's the lowest of the low. It's not the ghetto, it's below the ghetto. And you are a prince. And you got broke legs. And you're living in the ghetto. And he's been there for about 15 years. Don't you imagine he had given up hope? And wondering what was to become of him. He had accepted his faith down there. In fact, they said he had a wife and a little boy. And he's living down in Lodabar. He's not going to go back and challenge David because, number one, physically he can't challenge him. And number two, David is a mighty man of war. So he's not going to go challenge David and he's living down in Lodabar. And finally, King David thinks about the covenant that he made and he says, I want you to go and I like what one scripture says, go fetch him. Uh -huh. You know when you, you go get somebody, I can call you and tell you to come. But if I fetch you, I'm going to have to pack I'm going to have to pick your legs and mess up. You're going to have to go about 60 or 70 miles, and you are handicapped. And so David is taking great care to make sure that this broken young man gets to come to the table. And when he sees him, he says to him, I know the boy. Can you imagine what that ride was like? You know they killed the, uh, the royal folks that's in line could possibly try to overthrow. Can you imagine riding 70 miles? You know you can't run when you get there. You at the king's mercy. And David says to him, like God says to us, I fear not. <laughs> I, I mean to do you good. And so he does. He restores his land to him. All of what was Saul's, he restores to the fellowship. He gives him some workers to work the fields. And he says, this your boy's going to be
be taken care of. They're going to eat every day. Half of what these men, Ziba and his sons work. We're going to give this to you. He said, but you're not going to eat over there. Because I'm not inviting you to dinner, Mr. Phil the Chef. I'm not inviting you to dinner. <laughs> you got to sit at the table. So every evening when the king got ready to have supper, all of his children, no doubt, would probably come. You know, his boys, those excellent boys that he saw. You remember him? Can you remember Absalom and Adonijah and all of those boys would come around the table? and get ready for the meal, and then down the hall. Don't you see him? Crippled. He's slower. He won't get there at the same time as everybody else. But his seat's still going to be there waiting. And then he comes and sits at the table. And when you sit at the table, guess what, folks? You look like everybody else at the table. They don't see your broken legs when you sit at the table. You look like everybody else. And I think probably King David would look at Mephibosheth and say, boy, he looked like his daddy, don't he? Yeah. He remembered that. And then we go into the book of, we go into Romans. And the book of Romans is written by Paul. Oh. You said the Apostle Paul. Thank you, I heard y'all. You said the Apostle Paul, and he writes this book from Corinth, and he is saying, as our elder was saying when I came in, that we now, we're not like the regular folks. Now, this is not for everybody. I'm just going to tell you, this is not for everybody. This is for believers here. And he says, now that those of us who accept Christ, we are no longer under the law of the flesh, because we got something else. What do we have living inside of us? We got the Holy Ghost, we got the Holy Spirit, and now that Holy Spirit in us helps us. It helps us to be all that we are. And I believe that when the Father looks at us and sees the Holy Ghost in us, yes. and our permanent seat at the table, because we got one, because he goes on at the end of Romans and he says, what can separate us from the love? He said, there's nothing. So my seat is already going to be here all the time. And nothing's going to separate that when the Father looks at me, because I've got the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost always reminds us of Christ. He said, boy, look at that girl. She looked just like her dad. She looked just like that boy, my son. She looked just like him. And so then my faith is secure. My seat at the table is secure. I'm not worried about my seat at the table. But that doesn't mean I don't have an assignment. Joy, what time do we have? So, there is nothing for us if we come to Sunday school and just learn some scripture, and if we learn some stories, unless we have applications. So I do have a couple of questions I want to ask you. Right. Have you ever been to Lola Bar? Were you ever dropped? Yeah. You know, some of us may have been physically dropped, but some of us have had some emotional situations that we've been dropped. And I thank God that somebody came down to Lodabar and said, I, and some folks down in Lodabar, I believe that I ought to tell them that their father is sending them an invitation to sit at the table. I'm just telling you, I'm asking you, who is down in Lodabar that's waiting for you to come and bring the invitation from the father? Because there are folks still in Lodabar. I know Lodabar was over there in Israel, but you got a Lodabar in Baltimore, I know you do. I got a load of bar down there in Baytown, Texas. There's a load of bar down there. And there's some Mephibosheths down there that are broken and not for any fault of their own. And they can't walk. And so like the king said, I need you to go fetch it. And I think our king of kings is saying to us this morning, I got some people down there that I need to show some Remember your friend? Your friend has passed on, but her kid is still down there serving time. He's down there in Lodabar. Remember that girl that used to be so sweet and sang in the choir, but now she got a different and an alternative lifestyle. She's been dropped and she's in Lodabar. And she's waiting. 
and the king is saying to you, you got to go down and load the ball. And it's not going to be easy because she can't walk out. He can't walk out. That man can't walk out. They've been dropped. And so it's our job. We are the zebras. Go down there and fetch the king's folks down in Lodabar because our God has made a covenant. My pastor and my apostle would say, one evening, one Friday evening on a hill called Calvary, he did a, he made a covenant with us, a blood covenant. He shed his blood for us so that we could then become adopted in the family. And not only are we just a part of it, we are the family and we don't just say, he's our, he's our daddy. It says in this scripture, we say, Abba, Father, that's, that's my daddy. And to see my daddy, I, I mean, some people I know well, but my daddy, I can ask my daddy. Anything, my daddy gonna look out for me. And so we are sons and daughters, and we have been accepted by him. And we know who we are. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said? Wrote? We know who we are. We are the sons and daughters. And we will go to Lodabar. We will fetch those folks and give them the invitation. God bless you this morning. I hope you were helped by some of the highlights of our Sunday school.
And the trend, the trajectory of the lesson here is that we have to go down to Lodabar to fit some people. Well, the, the, the people that are down there may be educated, they may be business people, they may be multi-millionaires, they may be professors, but they're in Lodabar and they need to come up. Paul was one of those. He was a linguist. Yeah. He, he, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Yeah. He, he was one that stood when there were and held the cross of the poorest person that was stoning Stephen. Yeah, and what the elder has brought us up. How when, 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 when Ananias, Ananias had to go fetch him. <laughs> I don't know, I have to go back to it. And isn't it funny that when you said that, that reminded me, you can imagine that Mephibosheth, for all those years that he had those broken legs, he thought that that was such a bad thing for him. But really and truly, because he was broken and because he was down there, that was God's way of preserving him. And so a lot of times, just like with the Apostle Paul, he's blinded and then he has to go to Ananias. He has to humble himself. He has to go spend that time in the backside of the desert. He may have thought that was the worst thing that was happening to him, but it was the best thing that happened to him because he says then he, he, he is able to do what God has said. Do you know the different difference between a covenant and a uh and, and a contract. A contract can be so good yeah. that a breach. So I think mean, the contract man has that said all the time for about this or other. So a covenant keeps you bonded together no matter what it is. And you live by con you live by the covenant. Contracts when you get tired of it, anytime you can you can destroy it. Yeah. A covenant yeah. blow the contract. If you breach the contract, mm. then it's null and void. Yes. <laughs> but the covenant will last long oh, and the covenant, even if you breach the covenant, we are still obligated. And yes. that's the way it is with God. Aren't we glad that God is a covenant God? Because we breached the covenant, but God is still faithful. So we are glad that we are under the covenant. And David gives us a good example of how he is a man after God's own heart. And he is a covenant. Tell me what the Pauline epistles are. Since we didn't do a Q&A, the Apostle Paul, the Pauline epistles, what do you think that is? I know you said no other letters. Oh, we don't call any other letters. Very good, very good. The Apostle Paul writes a prison epistle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some prison epistles. Where did he write the prison epistles? He wrote them in prison. Prison, that is what I'm saying. Why did he write those prison epistles? From prison. So when you, a lot of times when you see that, you'll look at that, and that also affects us as to what he may be writing and addressing and how he's writing and addressing. It's one thing, Apostle, if you're going to address the church in person. It's one thing if you have to call back to the church and give them some instructions. So how you do that will modify it. I'm saying that to you so when you study your Sunday school lesson, you always want to look at context and you also want to look at what is the proper setting, what is the motivation behind why that writer is writing and to whom he's writing. And that will give us a good clue as to what's going on as far as our lesson text is concerned. All of those things are important because we are looking at it from 2023. That's something that happened thousands of years ago. So if we want to be more accurate about our teaching and understanding, then those are some of the things that we'll have to do. All right, Wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much. Amen for those enlightened. And you know one of the things too that you brought up, um, Miss Mephibosheth, when
when David invited him uh, to his table, he was wondering um, with his his kind of a um, statue. He was no important person. He didn't have no kind of creed. He, 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 he didn't have no nothing that the king deserved. Nothing that the king was expecting from him. And he was wondering why the king really invited me? What, what can I offer to the king? However, he accepted the invitation. A lot of times it makes us think we were we never deserve what God has. The calling, that, the calling that we have from God, none of us deserve it. And sometimes we have to look and see where we are coming from. The place where we are coming from and where we were and who we were. And because we accept the calling of God, sometimes it makes us wonder, uh, do I deserve all of this? Are we? Who are we for God to leave so many people out there and found us right now there at um, the place that you mentioned. Uh, it, that's right. Because knowing that so many people today who think that they are so important, who think that they should be, uh, uh, absolutely, they think that they are so important. But God look at the basic things and things that are rejected, those are the sort of ones that God bring out and call because they appreciate Him they don't think they have anything. So because of that, they appreciate what God has to offer to them. Today, we can only say that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Give the Lord a praise for the wonderful word of the day. We want to give God thanks for you, Sister Gilmore. Amen. And we want to see and we want to realize that we are now at the king's table. And do not, we, we must know how to behave ourselves, how to appreciate it, how to give thanks, and how to adore him being our king. Some people walk away from God. God has so much for them, but they didn't stay long enough to realize what God has for them. And this is one of the problems today. People don't stay long enough with God to realize the blessing that God has for them down the road. Let's stop this time on this toilet, our superintendent, will be coming again. We want to thank the Lord for Sister Gilmore. Amen. And for such a wonderful um, lesson talk. Amen. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. So our uh, superintendent will be coming on this toilet. Amen. Uh, will come to give us the uh, conclusion and the lesson for next week. Amen. Jesus, I never forget what he has done for me. Jesus, I never forget how he sets me free. Jesus, I never forget how he brought me out. Jesus, I never forget no neighbor. Oh, yes, how can I forget what he has done for me? Oh, how can I forget how he said?
the couple was a sort of shame to say they didn't Perhaps. want to take any of them when they were so dressed up. So um, they asked the attendant or the supervisor, haven't you had any, is there no um, more children here in the, in the orphanage? How do we get this? And, and, the, 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 and the, the person that was in charge said, yes, we have one, a little boy, but he's not fit to be adopted. Because he's not dressed up, he's not washed, he doesn't want to bathe, and, they, and he's not manly because they have problems with him to get him settled. And they said he's unlovable. Even his mother couldn't love him. So he was, so, so he, he, he was there. I mean, I look at it and I look at something and I want something there. Weren't we unlovable too? Because some of us, our behavior, nobody would, would really love us. So they said it in the woman. So the couple said, so the couple said, when you come, let us let us see him ourselves. Let us look at him for ourselves. Let us assess him. And he brought him out. And so when he brought him out, he was dirty. He, the, the clothes were ragged. He didn't have any shoes on his feet. And he and, and, and he was just standing. And he said, when he came, and he stood with all those that others was well dressed and looking so nice. He was rugged. And when you look at him, there's nothing that anybody would want to love him. And he said he came and he stood beside those children. And he hung his head in shame. He just hung his head in shame. And the couple looked at him. And then they said to the attendant, we'll take this one. Yeah, the couple said, we'll take this one. And the man was trying to find all the excuses in the book why they shouldn't take him. And the couple said, this is the one that we want. We'll take him. And then he said, and then he, he said, he felt guilty when they said that to him. And then he said to them, do you want us to, to tie him up and get him for you? They said, no. No, we don't want that. We'll take him just as he is. He will be a fit into our family. And they said, when he gets home, we will clean him up. We will do all of that for you. We'll clean him up. We'll clean him up. They said, Jesus. And we look at it and he said, weren't we all like that? No one wants a child just like that. But in spite of all we were, in spite of all we stayed, God looked beyond everything that we did. And he chose us. Didn't he? He chose us. Because when God looks at us, he isn't looking at our outward appearance of how we, of how we come and how we stay. In us, when he looked at David, he didn't see a murderer or whatever good, but he saw a king in David. When he looked at Gideon, Gideon didn't think he was worthy, but he saw what? A valiant man in Gideon, a man of valor. When he looked at us, he saw what? He saw a king. 
stop hustling the baby. Yeah. 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 When you look at Jeremiah, he saw a prophet that he could use. Because he was looking at what he was, what he, all the things that he was doing, he saw differently. So some of us have got to change our perception of people. Oh, we look at people. They might not look like us. But we train. Because why? We go 
grew up together as sisters. And we never change. We never change. Even if we don't even talk for six months. When we call, when we talk, call each other to talk, because of something, some emergency, I'm ready to go to him. When I was in college, she was sick and going to and going into operation. And I was in Boston College doing my master's in curriculum and instruction. And she called me and she said, Pauline, I'm going into operation. The children are here. And I need somebody to take care of them. I said, tell me when, what, what time you're going in for the operation. And she told me. And I was down there and spent that whole August. That whole August. I came down from like school early in May. And in July I went down there and stayed that whole August and take care of those children until she get out of the hospital. And even when she got out of the hospital, I didn't leave. I stayed there and I helped her out. And mark you, she had a husband that was there. But the husband, but the husband was that mean kind of a man. He wouldn't tell. And I stayed with those children, took care of them until she get out. Because why? That's my sister. So Bishop dear, she called on me for everything. Am I right, Bishop? Everything she called on me for. And I'm up there, going up there to help her. That's how we should believe. Let us all take, I tell you, these lessons are so great. It's deep enough to be saved. And let us accept them and take them. Let us go out there. There must be somebody who you know out there that need restoration. Because they are so, as I said at the beginning, they are so many wounded Christians out there in Lodibar. So many wounded, wounded in the church. And we need to get out there, find them, and see if we can restore them. See if we can bring them. As you said, fetch them, we're going to bring them. Washing. 